Hello, I am John Abbott, the producer and editor of a nostalgic oral history of shell font. Episode number three is entitled Barnstorming Main Street. Our intent is to visually display the transformation of shell font borough from an early farming community to suburbia. I think you'll like the aerial shots taken from a drone at the end of the video. Shelfont went through a radical change from a farming community uh, to a suburban one. During that time that I grew up here, during the 70s, uh, uh, late 60s and the 70s, uh, before that, the biggest growth spur here was kind of uh, post-war. Uh, one of the biggest uh, employers was Johnsonville Naval Air Station, and they built houses like Brittany Farms and those places to house those people that worked there and in the military, and that was a big draw to this area. And really kind of what happened in uh, the 70s and 80s was the pharmaceutical companies got really big and they were the main source of employment in the area. So that, that really kind of changed the complexion of everything in Chalfon. Uh, I, I remember when uh, my mother used to bring us up, up Bristol Road and then make a left on Butler Avenue um, and come up to the light here. And we would be one of the only two cars sitting at the light. And this was 8 o'clock in the morning. So that kind of tells you what the traffic was like. It wasn't anything near, it was dribs and drabs in the morning. It wasn't anything near what it is now. And that happened in a relatively short period of time. You'll see places like Oxbow Meadows. Uh, that was built in the 70s. And that was one of the bur first big bursts of uh, suburbia coming, of affluent suburbia coming to Chalfont. And then from there on, it really kind of uh, uh, went uh, straight you know, uphill from there, I, I would say as Chalfont became built out, uh, some of the bigger tracks, 20 acre tracks that were left in the borough, uh, then became housing developments rather than farms. So let's talk about how Chalfont has changed from a, uh, a rural community to a, a suburban community. Well, let's stop at the top of the hill at the water tower and head south down towards the main part of the borough. Um, at the corner of Maine and Sellersville, uh, was the Myers Farm, which is a 49-acre uh, dairy cattle farm. Uh, Mary Jane Clemens, a local icon, a tax collector, a judge of elections, a fire auxiliary, she grew up there and spent her childhood there. The Moyer cows, Edith and I, I used to walk with her lots of times, Moyer would also have a pasture on the other side of the railroad tracks from Railroad Avenue. And if you go out there, just a little past Westview Avenue, if you look to the left, you can still say, see it. It was like a tunnel under the tracks, and the cows would go under the, through that tunnel over to the pasture on the other side. But Edith and I would walk them up Main Street and then down Westview Avenue to Railroad and through that tunnel. You know, in our farm, each cow had a particular stall. And you wonder how a cow would know, but each cow would go into the stall they were supposed to go into. I don't know how they, they knew whether they had a scent like a dog would or what, but they always, they would know, they'd learn. I know my grandparents moved down to Chalfa from Bedminster Township in 1904. And I think one of the reasons was possibly that they could, at that time, ship milk to Philadelphia. And at one time, that was a big commodity for the farmers to ship them up to Philadelphia. And I think in the history of the train and the history I did, it said it took as much as 15 minutes to load all these milk cans onto the, the train. And that there was a conductor that would have a can of milk at the other end, but he never had any cows. It seemed he had an empty can and the can with water, and he would take milk out of some of the other cans till he got a can full and fill the, the ones he took out with, with water. That was a story that was told. I don't know if it was true or not. Alvin Moyer owned a, a town at Reading Terminal. They had a booth, and they would have that be there Tuesdays and Wednesdays. 
And Edith and I sometimes would take the train down on Wednesdays to attend the booth. And our treat was always to get ice cream at the Bassett's ice cream place, which I think is still there in the terminal. But Alvin would, besides his own things, he would take produce from the other farms too. My mother would send eggs and, and chickens. And my dad raised pigeons as a hobby, sort of. And he would um, kill squabs and dress a squab, and they would fly. These little squabs would bring more money than a, a dressed chicken because they were, like, I guess, your well to do people. This was a, a big thing for them to have these roast squabs or whatever. Here's a 1976 aerial photo of the Myers farm as it's beginning to be developed into Rosemore Estates. Beyond that, it will one day be called uh, Shadow Ridge. This is the beginning of some of the big development that happened in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. Behind the Myers farm is the Guthrie farm, which is now the Shadow Ridge development. The original farmhouse still sits there uh, in the center of development at 58 Linwood Drive. The Hellbird tracks were on both sides of Main Street near Westview Avenue. Uh, the one side, which is the east side, was used for Linden Field development to the development of condos, townhouses, and single-family homes. And on the other side uh, were the um, greenhouses uh, for their flower business and built a small little empire of being the carnation king uh, of the East Coast. What I understand is by 19, about 1980, 81, they became the largest growers of cut carnations east of the Mississippi River. and. Uh, uh, the, the caveat to that is, is that uh, the hard part about growing carnations in the east is that uh, you don't have, you've got colder weather and you don't have the, the high altitude that you have in Colorado, which is the one area where carnations are still grown in the U.S., nor do you have the gorgeous weather that you get in, in California. That's the other area where, where carnations are grown. Uh, so, uh, and the, the best place to grow carnations in the world is in Colombia because carnations grow best when they're at an altitude of about 7,000 feet above sea level. That's the, the perfect oxygen-carbon dioxide mix for, carbon, for uh, carnation growth. And uh, two, if the temperatures are between 40 and 70 is, is uh, the, the temperature range. And because Columbia is, they're high in the mountains at 7,000 feet, but they're on the equator, it's about 7,000 feet, and it doesn't get much lower than 40 at night, and it doesn't get much higher than 70 during the day. So it's a perfect place to grow carnations. And almost all of those Colombian carnations come up to the East Coast. So pretty much everybody else was going out of business. And uh, so uh, Dad was the only, uh, they were, uh, there were very, very few carnation growers left because of the competition coming in from, uh, from Columbia at the time. But carnations, you know, um, aren't true to seeds. You can't plant seeds and get a carnation. You know, the leaves are different on a carnation. They're narrow and so forth anyway. They come out in a cluster on the stem. They would take them off and they would have to root them, yeah. root them, put them in water and solution and um, then plant plant them that way from a cutting. No seeds would produce what you wanted. But that was a lot of work to, to do it to, uh, when Pop did and cross, cross them and so forth. Joe would wait for a, say he had a bed of, of pink carnations and all of a sudden he saw a different flower coming from the plant. That's when, that's when he would save all the cuttings from that plant and develop a new one from a, a uh, just one that appeared. And uh, if they, if the plant was a good grower, and it produced a good crop, and they lasted, and, and so forth, they'd use it. Otherwise, they throw it away. We grew a very good quality flower. Um, and, I mean, that was, I can remember going down to the flower show, and we would take, um, oh, anywhere from 15 to 18 vases of flowers down, and pretty much every one of them would come back with, a, with some kind of a prize. 
and I was told by people at the flower show that Dad had won more more awards as a grower than anyone else in the history of the flower show. We shipped to uh, to th pretty much three wholesalers that we uh, we sent to. We uh, we went to um, uh, Delaware Valley down in southern Jersey, uh, Neeson Brothers in in Philadelphia, and Ferris Brothers up in North Jersey were the uh, the three that we we sent to. And um, the uh, one of the things that uh, that Dad always told me. Um, uh, was that uh, uh, you can only, his, his words of wisdom was, you only get one chance to make a first impression, which I know that Dad pretty much was, was started, he had started to tell me that before, but I know he stressed it to me when uh, in the uh, six, late 60s and early 70s when my hair started to get uh, a, a shade longer than what he liked. Uh, I know it's hard looking at me now to realize that, yeah, it's, uh, in 1970-71, uh, I had uh, wavy blonde hair down to my shoulders. But, um, and I think probably uh, it drove Dad nuts, which was probably one of the reasons why I had hair down to my shoulders. So um, we were on a, a trip up to Ferris Brothers to deliver uh, uh, plants and carnations. And we're unloading, and I'm unloading with one of the, I think, like their general manager or something up there and uh, he looks at me and says you know you only get one chance to make a first impression and I think I probably heard it one too many times by that time and I looked at him and I said that's right I agree with that and believe me I won't hold this against you so uh -huh. and, and I probably shouldn't have said it and I realized afterwards that I probably shouldn't have said it so uh, I said, oh, geez, uh, there wasn't much said from that point in time on while we were unloading. Uh, I think that was the last interaction he wanted to have with me. So as we're driving back, um, I remembered one of the other things that Dad used to always tell me, and that is, be true to your word and be honest about all you've done. And I said, all right, I better tell him before he hears about it from anybody up here. I said, Dad, I think I may have made a mistake. He goes, what was that? So I tell him the instance. And he got quiet, and then all of a sudden he started laughing, and he said, well, I think they probably need us a little more than we need them. So what we would do, uh, and I can't remember how many, it was probably every two or three years, um, a carnation plants, uh, after, the, I mean, the first year they're very productive, and then they start losing the productivity of the plants, so you get fewer and fewer uh, cuttings, or fewer and fewer cuts off of each one. And um, um, so after the second or third year, what we would do, and this was one of, probably one of the, uh, the, the dirtiest jobs in the whole place, was that you would simply, all of the, the flowers are held up by wires and string. You have small wires on the length of the, the, uh, the bed and then strings going across. And what we would do is we'd just go and we'd cut all the wires on one end and on the other, and then you just start rolling these things up and it would pull the plants out while you rolled them and it was you were you were just completely dirty by the time you got done and then you had to drag the things out and then once you had them out now you've got just the bed with with all the dirt in it and what you needed to do was you needed to take all that dirt out of the bed uh, take it out and sterilize it so that you ended up killing off anything anything that was totally unwanted out of that soil so what we had was over by the barn we had a pile of, of, of sterilized dirt, which was totally covered and, and, uh, uh, and always covered. And what we would do, then there was an open section of the concrete slab, we'd bring all the dirt out that we had um, uh, in those beds, put it there, and then we would cart the dirt back in from the sterilized pile. And then we'd cover the sterilized pile, the unsterilized pile with, um, uh, with uh, tarps, and you would pump in uh, steam, hot, you know, hot, hot steam into there. So it, I guess it, you know, 200 to 212 degrees was was uh, pumped into the uh, uh, to the um, uh, the unsterilized pile, and that would sterilize all that uh, soil, kill off all the uh, the germs and the, the weeds and everything in the soil. So um, it was it was always oh, it was it was not one of my favorite times, that's for sure. Traveling to the next parcel south is the Moyer Farm. The Moyer Farm was at one time more than 19 acres and stretched across Railroad Avenue, um, but at some point that was sold off 
And in the late 90s, uh, the Moyer family sold the Moyer farm and it was developed as a townhouse development with 85 townhouses, the new post office, as well as the Moyer farmhouse, which was retained as a retail shop. Uh, the the uh, barn there was an iconic fixture in the community for many years. It was built in 1843 and it was an enormous big red barn and on the top of it had a cupola with a spire on it. Uh, they use it to give directions. If you've gone up 152 to the barn, you've gone too far. Or if you've gone too far south and you've passed the barn, you've gone too far. So people in the area knew the barn and knew it as a landmark to show people where to go next. Uh, we used to play in the corn shed um, when it was empty. That I don't know if you ever seen the corn cribs that they had with their wooden sides and openings along the side. Well, when that was empty in the summertime before they harvest corn, Edith and I used to have a playhouse in there. We'd play house in the corn crib. You see it, you hear it run, that is what you're buying. Right? Five hundred dollars right there, somebody would get five hundred, four fifty, somebody would get four fifty, four hundred dollars. Three! Two hundred dollars to start it there, somebody would get two hundred dollars right there, somebody hundred and fifty dollars. Give you hundred and fifty dollars for it. Hundred dollar bill. Some give you a hundred dollars, a hundred and a quarter, hundred dollar bill, give it a hundred and ten dollars. 1950s soda there. I'll tell you what, including myself, I got a 1987, and it don't run any quieter than that does there. There's a lot of metal in there, and you're buying that right there. See it there? You hear it run, and that is what you're buying. Tiling everything is here, so there's your chance. That building there was originally an ice house. They used to uh, take ice from the creek and uh, pack it in there when they had ice all summer long when they went to uh, Philadelphia to the terminal. It was, uh, this part here was my grandmother's chicken house. She always had about 15 chickens, and that was her uh, chicken house where the wind is and that door. The rest of it was machinery shed.